Hi, Roland Mirator with Propinquity Advisors. I'm here at Fund Forum USA 2012. I'm here with Seb Dovey from Scorpio Partnership, an organization that does a tremendous amount of work analyzing and understanding what wealthy people want and what they do around the world, specifically regarding financial services and so forth. Uh, Seb gave a very, very interesting presentation earlier on a number of different topics. One of the things that is quite interesting is thinking about um, the psychology of, of the wealthy and um, what things go into the decisions that they make from a financial perspective um, that may be different than, than retail and other types of, of investors. Want to talk to that a little sure. bit? Sure. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that we always find interesting about the private client is the way the financial services industry looks at them. They almost think of them as a different species, uh, which they're clearly not. And all of the research that we do tries to get to the bottom of what makes them happy, uh, what makes them a consumer in financial services and right now what they're actually saying to us very clearly is that they want to be better engaged um, they have a, a view of their value to the industry and they have a view of what they're expecting um, and it's a lot more clear than the financial services industry realizes and, and what types of things are the wealthy looking for from, from asset managers and wealth managers? I think I, you, if you break it down, one of the clear things is when you ask a wealthy person what they have now and what they would like to have in, in, the, in the future, um, all around the world, and particularly the US clients that we interviewed as well, would say that whatever wealth level they have today, they'd like to triple it. Uh, and they'd like to do that pretty quickly, in fact. They have confidence that they can do it quickly. In fact, what we find consistently is they'd like to do that within a decade. But they're very aware of who they need to turn to to get them to achieve that goal and the role of the financial advisor is very clear. It's not one that they particularly are happy with because they haven't seen a great amount of uh, satisfaction in the experience in the past but they know that they can achieve that wealth without that support. And do you see these trends coming together in, ter in terms of what's going on globally? Is there convergence in, in terms of how wealthy you're looking at their money and looking to grow it or are there still some, some geographical um, differences in, in approaches? I I think that there there are some there are some distinctions globally uh, with the different geographies around what people do with their money. It's more to do with how the financial markets in each of those regions are set up rather than any issues with the client. What we see from the client side is a pretty consistent way in which they manage their money. In terms of the way forward over the next say three to ten years, what we are seeing is an increased level of um, let's say autonomy over or perceived autonomy over how people manage their money. Um, they'd like to be able to work with a financial advisor where they feel that they are also in control. So some of the words that the industry has used around discretionary and advisory will have to adapt to meet that. Um, there's also the convergence with regards to the digital space and it's the fact that there's much more information now than there has ever been. Um, it's aggregated, it's researchable, it's inform informative mm -hmm. to a private client. Remember these are people that have millions of dollars of investable assets but that doesn't make them experts with regards to managing their money but they're pretty good at finding out how to reach experts and also how to make decisions of themselves. So that's going to have a big dynamic on the way the consumer uses financial services. And does that have also implications for um, the younger millionaires, the younger wealthy that are uh, utilizing financial services and, and are trying to figure out what it is to do with their money? Are they more prone to use digital um, than, than perhaps their parents may have been? Well, I, I suppose society would like us to think that way, yeah. that it is the youngers that are going to be using the digital space more. Right now most of them are using it for iTunes, but um, in the context of who's using digital the most, it's very interesting actually. The research is becoming very clear. This is of thousands of high net worth around the world, but even in the US. When it comes to money matters, it's actually the elder people, mm -hmm. elder millionaires, that are much more actively engaged with the digital space, so-called the silver surfer. But uh, that that's also interesting. What I do think, and I agree with you, is that perhaps as we go forward over the next five to ten years, how the digital arena if impacts financial services is going to be very much affected by how the younger generation are using digital in all walks of life. So they are going to be very frustrated when they come to financial services and find that they can't interact in it in the way that they could with regards to other parts of their lives. Whereas in fact the elderly who are using digital right now kind of accept the offer mm. that they get. Mm. If we think about how wealth has been managed over the last century or so, and we think about what has happened in 2008 with the financial crisis, what's currently going on in Europe, is there a shift in the way 
that wealth is being managed? Is there a new model? If, if we think back, perhaps it's the Swiss private banks that mm -hmm. are seen as, as the, the, the driving force in, in the model of, of wealth management, but mm -hmm. they're obviously under a lot of pressure with FATCA and other things. Is there a model? Is it, is it shifting in one direction or another? It's too early, given that we're only four years away from a, one of the largest seismic crises, and arguably we're still in it. But in, there are some early signs, and I think one of the things that we start to see is, from the customer perspective, is the way that the portfolios were rebalanced as a result of 2008. Whether we agree with how clients have moved their money back into lower risk assets and so forth is really up to us and them. But what they're doing with regards to how they're reconnecting with the market, remember these are individuals that want to triple their wealth within a decade for argument's sake. Um, they are looking at ways in which which asset classes will provide them with that return. Um, and it's not necessarily the asset classes that the financial services market are well equipped to support. Now, for example, that could be directly into companies, um, companies that they understand. Uh, it could be into markets that the companies are not actually involved with, and so on. So there's a, there's a stretch with regards to what it is that the clients will look at in terms of their investments. That's very generally speaking. I think on the other side, in terms of what are the dynamics around the way in which customers are going to manage their money and want their business to be managed. You sort of see a fusion of words, it's almost active discretionary. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept of not necessarily giving your funds entirely over to the business of the financial markets and coming to see your portfolio statement every other six months, but actually seeing that you can have a dynamic involvement with the business money being managed all the time. Um, that considers, uh, from a client's perspective, to be very popular. Um, what we'll see is that there'll probably be a spike of interest and enthusiasm to do it and then over time because people have other things to do they'll start to drift away from taking an active role but right now what we see very clearly all around the world but particularly in the US is customers will say I want to keep a very close eye on how you manage my funds mm -hmm. and so I regain the confidence of the way that you manage my funds achieves my objectives over my time period because of the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. The last thing I wanted to ask you about was the notion of a trusted advisor mm. clearly within wealth management that's one of the, the keystones uh, have we seen a, a change in the number of trusted advisors that are being utilized by by the wealthy does that number increase as as the wealth increases what's what's the dynamic there when different markets there's different sort of rules of thumb I mean, on a global basis everyone tends to say that there are three or four advisors for every account What's interesting to us is that when we interview customers and say how many advisors do you actually actively choose, they would never say that they looked for three or four advisors. Most of them would like to have a concentrated relationship with one. That's the old way of looking at it. What we're now seeing going forward is that customers are starting to say, there's a certain profile that I look to to be my omnibus advisor. And then there are a certain range of providers underneath that might be product suppliers specifically. But I will use that advisor to be the, uh, essentially the gatekeeper to that. You see that at the family office level, but you even see it at the retail and high net worth level too. And that's become very compelling. One of the other things in terms of the number of advisors is which markets vary differently. Um, in Asia, for example, right now we've just done some work where Chinese clients have somewhere between seven and ten advisors, uh, whereas uh, Singaporeans have between two and four. And then that could be just numerics. We also see in the US it's typically around about three, but we're seeing a very significant shift in all of those markets towards the seeking out of a financial advisor first and foremost they're all on a quest for someone that can manage the plan and, and I think that's significant that is going to be a step change for this industry you know are the wealthy willing to pay for advice if they get good advice most definitely program? most definitely and you you have clear examples of that if, if you use as a sort of case study the evolution of the family office space where evidently the family client is paying for a business that will provide them with a financial plan you could argue that theoretically that's a demonstration but even at the lower levels of wealth and lower in the millionaire economy context. Yes, they will pay. There's a challenge for the industry to demonstrate value in terms of the cost for that payment. But the reality is that customers continue to ask, and they've got to understand that they have to pay for something. Yeah. Um, they can't do it all through the back door of retrocessions, and they won't be able to in the future with regulation. But yes, they do accept value. Okay. Very good. Thank okay. you. Pleasure. Pleasure.